the next talk everyone is going to be on what is cloud native integration by michael costello uh, michael are you here i'll just give him a couple of minutes if he's there okay Hello. Hey, Ayush, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Are you ready? All right. And then, um, I suppose, can you see this? Yes, we can. Groovy. All right, great. All the best. We'll start in two minutes. Yeah, sure, that's completely up to you. You can wait for two minutes. Just let me know when you're ready. Okay. I think this is a very popular topic and everyone would want to hear about this. I've personally spoken to two, three of them that are very interested in your talk. Cool, cool. Um, we'll give it one more minute and then I'm probably gonna start kind of on the dot. Um, there's a lot to get through and I'm gonna try to uh, demo live, so. Oh, okay, <laughs> super exciting. All the best for that. Cool. All right, everybody, um, thanks for attending this talk. Um, today, we're going to talk about uh, what is cloud native integration. And more specifically, we're going to get into some cloud native architecture, and we're going to talk about some cooling, uh, some tooling with um, Apache Camel K. Um, my name is Michael Costello. I'll give you guys a quick um, introduction to who I am, um, and then we'll talk about the agenda of the things we're going to talk about. Um, I'm a programmer. I've been doing it about 20 years um, in the distributed software space. Um, I like to call myself a um, uh, uh, a reformed enterprise Java guy. Um, I'm a senior architect at um, Red Hat in the enterprise integration uh, practice in our emerging technologies practice. And um, if you want to check me out further, um, please do. Um, have some articles. Um, would love to get responses, so on and so forth. So um, there's some linkage there um, that um, you can go and check me out at. So um, today, what we're going to talk about is, of course, cloud native integration. Um, it's a term that we've um, uh, been using lately to describe our emergence into the cloud and some of our traditional integration techniques. So um, uh, just so we don't get too far ahead of ourselves, um, we're going to talk to about how we came to enterprise integration practices and something called Apache Camel. Um, we'll give a prequel to the cloud, um, SOA and the enterprise service bus pattern. And then we'll talk about moving some of these integration patterns um, and enterprise integration patterns, some of these um, new approaches that we've taken um, as we emerge out of kind of our traditional legacy uh, mainframe environments. And we'll talk about how we move these things to the cloud. We'll talk about what cloud native architecture is and why you would use something like Apache Camel and how to apply it to Apache Camel. 
Um, we'll do a live demo. Um, we're going to have to be super quick. We only have um, uh, really 20 minutes. We want to leave a few minutes open for questions. And of course, um, the as a result, the demo is going to have to be a very, very, very small subsection of a much larger demo where we really, really get into some multi-cloud, um, hybrid cloud, multi-tenant concerns, um, and speak about some of the architectural thing, the choices we've made um, to uh, be quote unquote cloud native. Um, uh, I've got an, a GitHub URL there. It uh, will be again in the um, slide deck. And of course, um, I'll, uh, I'll make sure I put that into the chat as we get to the questions. So real quick, how did we come to enterprise integration patterns? And then this thing called Cam, uh, Apache Camel. So once upon a time, as you guys will um, all remember, we found ourselves on mainframes and we had bus architectures where um, uh, different programs on our mainframe could kind of pick up from each other and um, uh, do their work or just simply do their work themselves. We moved away from this into client server topologies, and all of a sudden we had a need for remote invocation. Um, as we moved into this kind of new world where um, we distributed out our compute and our compute processes, what we, one of the things that we, uh, we started making um, some tooling leaps as a result. We started to look at things like uh, asynchronous messaging. Uh, IBM's MQ series is one of the classic um, things that comes to mind that became, became quite dominant in the 90s and aught years and still ha um, has quite a presence today. Um, and these kind of things modeled um, our traditional uh, patterns that we had on mainframe systems, while we, um, but still allowed us to have remote invocation. Now we could have a series of um, uh, runtimes and a series of servers out in the wild, and they could all kind of communicate to each other, but using fairly t uh, similar techniques. What happened uh, uh, during this period of time um, is we had a lot of different tools, right? And um, a lot of people were knocking on the same doors. And Gregor Hopp, um, a, uh, one of the guys who contributed largely to the enterprise integration patterns, um, made a really good point. Um, Ultimately, at the end of the day, we have many similar concepts here, but we have many, 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 many different tools. If we look at um, ESBs, for instance, um, TIBCO had their own tool, Lombardi, inevitably, IBM Wesby, uh, Oracle with their Liquid Fusion product, um, uh, so on and so forth. And um, however, we were kind of um, with Enterprise Java, um, other remote invocation tools, we were kind of running into the same things. And um, inevitably, um, we distilled these um, uh, into a set of what we call enterprise integration patterns, where we took these kind of common patterns and said, hey, we find these things applying themselves very generally in enterprise contacts. Some of these things could be the um, uh, splitter patterns, service mediation, so on and so forth. And so standards uh, began emerging. And what we started noticing in a lot of the tooling vendors, right? So specifically Apache Camel is one of those tools, is we started to say, hey, we need some semantically meaningful, idiomatic way to describe these things, right? We need um, domain specific languages and we need to have uh, patterns kind of uh, idiomatically baked into um, our language. And if we look over here to the right, we'll see a really small snippet of, a snippet of camel where we start to see where, um, uh, these kinds of things that are um, semantically meaningful. We know from, we're going from a JMS queue, um, and then we want to do some parallel processing, and inevitably we have some other um, idioms that really reflect what uh, is happening underneath the covers from a technology standpoint. Um, these things would often come with hundreds of adapters. So as we kind of made our way into this new world, we could say, hey, we have um, a idiomatic way to describe our enterprise behaviors um, based on these things called enterprise integration patterns. And oh yeah, by the way, and um, pretty much every tooling vendor um, have these things. We also have these hundreds of adapters to other systems like SAP, Salesforce, ServiceNow, so on and so forth. So we kind of, we got to this place where you have this kind of tooling in the SOA uh, uh, space. And um, most of it kind of um, uh, lent itself towards the enterprise service bus pattern, which was uh, typical based on where we were coming from. 
And so this uh, led us with to a bunch of great places. Um, we were able to expose reusable service endpoints over common communication standards. Now, no longer did we have um, a kind of fun trying to figure out how to um, serialize over the wire differently for this other tool, right? Um, we had a, a common means of uh, um, communication over the bus. We were able to loosely couple. This gave us our service-oriented architecture construct of everything being on an island. This is analogous to what we find right now in microservices. Um, and what this allowed us to do is say, hey, because my two bits of processing or my two um, things uh, that are doing the work are loosely coupled, they can attend to different things and they can change at different rates. This was a, this was great because everybody kind of had their own notion of responsibility as they were delivering bits into our enterprise. And this also led us to uh, adapt legacy services via the set of adapters and things that we baked into these appliances that allowed those things to conform to normal communication standards. Now, if I had some big mainframe process in the background, no bother. I just simply use my um, something like Apache Camel. Et voila, now it can talk to a host of other services, so on and so forth, over this, um, over this message bus pattern. Um, and this offer, uh, offer also offered us a, comp uh, um, a a really great um, tool set to do these things with. Um, oftentimes, I would have um, not just a common protocol for communication, but I would also have a canonical uh, message standard, right? Um, I, every message that happened over the bus and that you subscribe to would um, uh, have the same things, right? And um, this made uh, things very predictable, easy to implement. And um, many of these tools, like Apache Camel, your Tipco's, Liquid Fusions of the world, all had great IDE, so you could really just kind of drag and drop, get your work done, and let kind of um, our enterprise service bus appliance or some of the other SOA appliances that we ended up with um, uh, take care of the work. Unfortunately, um, this did kind of present um, some new challenges to us. Um, we still had um, complex interactions that required state management. As we're no longer sitting there in the run in the same runtime, we started to have some trade-offs between consistency, availability, and partitioning of our data. Right, um, cap theorem still definitely applied, and um, quite frankly, cap theorem becomes more difficult in a distributed context. Um, integration implementations were often coupled to platform-specific interfaces. So um, as we saw with the JBI standard from Enterprise Java that was retired quite quickly, or um, uh, even uh, a precursor to Camel, service mixes, normalized message router, these things were very, very, very specific. The implementations were very specific um, to the appliance that you were using. What this inevitably meant that I was bound inextricably to the APIs that my tooling were presenting. Um, and it wasn't really, uh, it, it ended up being quite like a, a bad place to be because maybe those things didn't really accommodate my needs. Um, additionally, um, we popularized a central governance model. Um, we would have schema registries and discoverable services, um, uh, so on and so forth, over our, our ESB or other SOA appliance. Um, and unfortunately, what this ultimately meant, and I think you know many of us have sat through them, is if there, we needed any change to the business, this had to be expressed through our central governance model. In fact, we likely had a canonical message that everybody in the business had to adapt to. What this meant is all our run times would spend all their time picking out what was meaningful to them, throwing away the rest, and then trying to figure out how to cobble that all back together once they'd done their work in a way that the next got, uh, thing could handle. And so um, this may change um, uh, come to an absolute snail's pace. I personally have sat in many, 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 many steering committees where like literally we, we spent months trying to figure out how to accommodate everybody. Um, what ends up happening is we all put our Martin Fowler hat on and microservices emerge. So on the integration highway, we, we had some point to point stuff that we initially discussed, right? got uh, point, you know, uh, remote invocation between two points. We then um, adopted SOA, uh, service-oriented architecture, and we ended up with ESBs where everybody kind of could link up to a, uh, a common hub and spoke um, uh, type of infrastructure. Um, uh, and then inevitably we came up with microservices. And these, and these are kind of taking on some of the same
same capabilities that our service-oriented architecture did, but a little bit different. Um, what we want these things to do is to have independent deployment pipelines act um, uh, completely independently. We would not want them coupled to any of our other services or certainly a service implementation type. Um, and this allowed us to be more flexible um, in our deployment types, more agile um, in how we go about our SDLCs as we now have independent deployment pipelines. And if we really put our Mountain Martin Fowler, uh, Fowler hats on, we went so far as to silo our um, data stores and databases um, such that uh, an, a microservice would have its own database. Well, that was cool, right? And um, it got us a lot of stuff. However, um, we began to move to the cloud and there were some expectations of moving to the cloud that changed the viability of microservices and started to instill some new pain points. So one of the first concerns we um, needed to attend to was, well, now our infrastructure is ephemeral. Um, we need to be able to tolerate failure. We also wanted our old stuff, our um, stuff that sat in our data center to be able to talk to new stuff in the cloud. And we wanted to go promise to our boss who was funding all this, this um, hey, don't worry about the fact that we've gone over to AWS. No bother, we're cloud native, so we can go take this to any cloud, right? Um, and now that means that we have to take on capabilities in our microservices that allow for these sorts of things, right? We have compute density and efficiency front and center. We've said, hey, we're going to go to the cloud. That's going to be cheaper. We don't have to go buy a new data center every time we want a, um, a, a new kind of enterprise feature. However, small problem, that also you know, uh, makes us responsible to maintain a notion of compute density and efficiency um, uh, that's quite lean. That also, again, began um, influencing our architecture, so on and so forth. And inevitably, we distribute architecture across cloud infrastructure and availability zones. One of the ways that people started kind of attempting to handle this is an abstraction called the uh, 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 container platform, something that many people are kind of uh, very um, uh, familiar with now, and that's become a central tenet of our architecture. So we can attempt to um, uh, deal with things like you know uh, failure of our architecture and not have to have a completely different set of appliances to handle that, so on and so forth. Compute density, how we schedule these things, so on and so forth. And this allowed us to kind of follow our microservices architectural viewpoints and decompose into smaller runtimes. And it lends itself neatly to having these kinds of um, independent deployment pipelines, so on and so forth. However, of course, um, this also leads to a new set of endpoints. We all of a sudden um, had one big, huge microlith, right, or monolith, and now we've distributed that out into 30 runtimes. Um, that's, uh, uh, that requires a whole new and phenomenally more robust set of tooling um, that collects metrics and health information about our runtimes. Um, we had um, Kubernetes, or a container platform, to abstract away cloud-specific uh, um, infrastructure APIs. Now I don't have a wildly different experience when I go to Azure versus when I go to AWS. US, but we've also taken on all these other concerns that we saw on the left-hand side, and now developers need to go build in high availability, redundancy, and cloud characteristics into their applications. It doesn't come for free, and as we've all seen over the last several years, developers are spending much of their time attending to these platform needs as opposed to actually doing the work that they need to do for the business. Um, as we mentioned, the, our monolith decomposition led to an exploitment of deployments, and it's difficult to go say to our, um, uh, uh, our superiors, hey, we've moved to the cloud and it's far more expensive. And then, of course, there's still a need to maintain state um, reliably in a cloud context, much like we would have done in in our, um, in our traditional world. However, um, we need to be able to uh, um, handle the loss of um, an individual runtime, availability zone, storage, potentially even a region. So our, um, we still have this need for our state stores and our sources of truth to be meaningful and real and persist. However, our tooling doesn't really accommodate that. Cool. So um, here we see uh, my team and I have actually made a honest effort at defining what cloud native means. And um, we won't spend too much time on this slide, but some of the cloud native characteristics that we take on need to be um, that we're elastic, we're scalable on demand, we're resilient. And I mean, really resilient, not just like, hey, my runtime comes back up, but hey, I'm 
able to survive loss of a data center. We need to be observable, manageable. We need to be location agnostic. Remember, our runtimes are gonna come and go. Our storage may come and go. All these things may come and go. We, we need some means of um, uh, deployment and service discovery that doesn't depend on static things. We need to be API centric, right? And we need to be event driven. That's all spelled out. The last two things um, are all spelled out in the article that you see there. Please take a peek and of course, file a GitHub issue if you disagree. But one thing that we notice is to be cloud native, it's more than just a move to the cloud. If we rely solely on a single cloud API, um, we're only native to that cloud. Right now, when I go from AWS to Azure, I get to be the person who uh, um, delivers the message to my boss. Hey, um, that'll be another nine months. Um, we need uh, we've abstracted uh, these proprietary cloud APIs via Kubernetes. So Kubernetes or con a container platform um, becomes great, but that's really not enough in and of itself to be truly cloud native and to capture these characteristics on the left hand side of the screen. We need something that actually does caring and feeding for our deployments that attends to some of these things, such as observability, manage uh, manageability. Um, so on and so resilient scalability. And so we need something like um, the operator SDK. I won't get into the operator SDK uh, and what it is, but um, again, uh, please go check out this article. Um, we just explain it in um, uh, nauseating detail. All right. So where does that leave us, right? We have these new things as we move to the cloud that we need to attend to. We have point to point, we had enterprise, the enterprise service bus, which was great. We had microservices, which started to take some of the pain points away, but also added some new pain points. And our next logical place to go, um, because it does attend to these concerns is um, serverless. Now, what does that mean in regards to our traditional ESBs, our traditional enterprise integration appliances, so on and so forth? Well, in the Apache Camel world, we have something called um, uh, Camel K. And what this allows us to do is write that little camel, semantically meaningful Camel DSL that you saw previously in a bunch of different languages, Java, XML, YAML, Groovy. We're able to care and feed for these things um, uh, very simply uh, via the Kubernetes, uh, a Kubernetes operator. We have a CLI, we'll show that off in a second. Um, we have sub-second sub deployment and startup time using Quarkus. If you don't know what Quarkus is and you're a Java developer, check it out, it's super cool. And um, we want to be able to run integrations in serverless mode, meaning we want to be able to scale to zero, and then we want to be able to scale to n replicas based on some sort of metric, be it CPU, the number of messages we have coming in, so on and so forth. And um, we want that to happen algorithmically. So meaning I don't want to just scale to, from zero to one. I potentially want to scale from zero to eight, back down to four, back up again to 10, so on and so forth. Um, we also um, have a need to be API-centric and event-driven. And um, Knative is something which we'll describe here in this next slide that allows us, that allows us to do that. So um, Knative eventing provides a pub-sub abstraction for um, uh, this type of stuff. And if we'll see on the right-hand side, what we inevitably have is a broker, um, which could be anything. It could be in memory. It could be Kafka, which we'll show in a second. NATS, GCP, PISA, uh, GCP, pub sub, and more. We create channels much like you would in any kind of um, pub sub uh, environment. And then we have Knative services that can be serverless and scale to zero, <clears throat> and also carry along um, algorithmic ways of scaling. Right. Um, uh, that are actually making subscriptions here. We have, um, this all happens over HTTP 1. Um, uh, so all we need for these services, so on and so forth, to be able to speak is HTTP 1. There's no, there's nothing specific about it. And um, this, this allows us to say, hey, even though I have a store, a state store like Kafka, underneath as a broker implementation of, of my uh, PubSub um, architecture, no bother, that could be anything. In fact, my services, service A and service B here, don't need to know anything about Kafka. All they need to know is how to consume and produce from one of these channels. Um, this, allows us to, uh, this allows us to take on the decomposition that we have for microservices, but do it in a, um, a way where we have compute efficiency. Now when service A and service B may not necessarily need to be running because there's no real payloads um, they need to attend to. Well, et voila, no bother. Um, Camel K provides seamless integration. 
real quick, this is what we've got here. Um, don't worry about the left-hand side um, unless you're doing the uh, demo, that um, uh, the full-on demo. But inevitably, we'll have some Kafka channels, we'll have some subscriptions, and then we'll have some things um, uh, that pick up from there. So real quick, um, let's go ahead and um, do a demo. All right. And you should see the, my entire screen. Cool. So here we have um, some. All right. So I'm uh, in a um, container platform. And here I have two integrations running. Um, they uh, have subscriptions. Um, they subscribe to uh, some channels. And if we describe one of these channels, we'll notice this is what we call a Kafka channel. In fact, we'll notice that the channel template actually has five partitions into um, replicas. So that's pretty cool. We know that we have um, those things. We need some way to, um, and let's go ahead and check out our broker. We have a default broker. And um, the way that this um, broker shows up is I actually just have a label here um, that says eventing.knative.dev.injection. And et voila, the way that I've wired up Knative eventing, this actually um, uh, happens. So let's take a quick, again, um, so let's go ahead and give ourselves something that's going to kick off those two integrations that we uh, just saw. Sorry for moving around. I have to go back to my cheat sheet. And we're actually going to use the camel CLI that we talked about um, to create an integration that will participate in this pub sub behavior. So here we go. Let's see, let's interrogate that. And we'll notice the our event sync integration is building a kit. So um, we've got that going on right now. And if we, um, let's go over and look at what we're actually doing here. So in our event sync integration, oops, wrong guy. In our event sync integration, what we're going to do, that's what we just created, is we're going to say, hey, I want you to create 50 messages. I'm going to do um, some of the idiomatic stuff that I talked about previously. We're going to do a quick transform. We'll set the body. And then what I want to do is I want to go off uh, to a key native channel testing DB events. And as you'll notice, this has no understanding of what testing DB events, what the channel is. It has no idea that it's Kafka. We then have something called event bus a transformation integration. And real quick, what we'll do here is we're just going to pick up off of a channel. We're going to do, again, a simple transformation of our body, of the message payload. And then we'll just lay off again to another Knative channel. Again, hey, we have. Michael. Hey, Michael, sorry, you have five more minutes, just reminding you. Great. And then um, uh, we have one more guy, and we're going to do the same thing. We're going to pick up from something, and we're going to leave uh, off. Uh, we're going to do our work. We're going to do a conversion, a transform, right? Um, and we're going to lay off to the next channel. So let's see how it's going over here. Cool. And now what we'll notice is what we we're happening. What we wanted to happen there just happened. We'll notice that the uh, the event sync integration that was quickly built by my Camel CLI, great uh, DevX for any, any of our developers. Let's take a peek at what it did. So it's sending off those messages to those Knative channels. We'll take a peek at our event bus transformation. Oops. One more thing here. You see, we're picking up messages and we're doing the stuff that we said we were going to do, our businessy stuff. And um, what we'll see here is we have the same thing happening in the Dev Const tra uh, Transformer integration.
Uh, real quick, um, probably shouldn't do this, probably don't have enough time, but let's go over to, I'm running StreamD for, um, to get myself some Kafka stuff. We'll notice some Kafka brokers here. Let's take Zek into one of these guys real quick. And um, let's uh, make sure that um, there's nothing up my sleeve, um, that we actually do have these things, these channels, subscriptions, so on and so forth in Kafka. So um, we'll CD into the bin directory. We'll do a Kafka topics. And in just a second, we should see um, a list of topics, bang. And if we notice, those are the same channels that we had just created. We'll notice um, that it came in our, uh, that we're names, we have in our topic namespace, um, the namespace that we were just in, so on and so forth, right? So um, if we were to do a, uh, um, if we were to do a uh, consumer, uh, a console consumer, we would see the messages that we just saw being logged out. And um, that is the uh, um, that is the uh, end of our demo. Um, uh, there's a much bigger demo available here at this particular GitHub URL. Um, I'm ap I apologize. I left everybody with very little time for Q and A, but um, we'll go ahead and um, set up for Q and A now. Thanks, Michael. <clears throat> that was a very thorough presentation. Thank you for that. Um, I'm just looking at the Q&A section. I don't see any questions as of yet. Okay, one question is, can you link the GitHub repo here? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Let me stop sharing so I don't show you guys. Um, oops. Everyone wants to replicate your demo. Uh, absolutely. All right. Just put it in there, and there should be, um, uh, I linked the slides, um, uh, so on and so forth. Um, we have, a, um, there's a couple of different GitHub repos to take a peek at, um, where we attempted to find what it means to be cloud native, um, and then a very thorough demo in order to how to take what we just did, make it cloud native, or make it, not just make it cloud native, but make it multi-cloud and hybrid cloud as well. Okay, that's great. Um, if anyone else has any more questions, I will just link the breakout rooms. You're free to talk to Michael over there. And yeah, thank you so much, Michael. Thanks, everybody.